Last summer, the peace of this quiet English garden was shattered by the discovery of a huge grave. Who lies in it and why were they buried here? archaeological mystery which has brought me to the Cotswolds, to Malmesbury. Which in the medieval period used to have some really important inhabitants. Well, I've heard that a local gardener may well have dug one of them up. It's all happened in the shadow of Malmesbury's imposing abbey, in the grounds of Abbey House. Its exuberant gardens are the work of Martin Roberts. He'd just been doing a spot of planting of when his spade struck something hard. <laughs> Well, how come you end up finding a coffin in the garden, though? We're digging over a rose bed, and we're it's up here. Yeah. Uh, we're looking, told to look out for a water pipe. The garden is in the grounds of the original abbey, which Henry VIII disbanded in 1539. At the end, in amongst the bushes, a magnificent medieval stone coffin, at least six or seven hundred years old. It's beautiful, isn't it? In the corner of the hole, a second, simpler burial suggests that the coffin could be part of a cemetery. What was your first reaction when you found it? Uh, shock. <laughs> a bit of amazement. Yeah. I wasn't sure what I'd actually found. Um, I cleared that area away there. Then I decided well, best to clear it away with my hands. And, uh, and suddenly a row of teeth appeared here. And uh, you realised it was occupied. <laughs> That's it. It's so fine, isn't it? So, so beautifully made suggests that it's somebody quite important. Whoever lies under the earth, deep inside the coffin, had certainly qualified for a grand send-off. But the thing that struck me was its size, over seven foot long. Even inside, it's six foot four from head to toe. Cut to fit someone really tall by any standards. By medieval standards, they must have been a giant. Excavation will give us more clues about this extraordinary person. Abbey House and the Gardens belong to postmodernist architect Ian Pollard and his wife Barbara, a former model. They're not the most orthodox pair, but a giant amongst the roses was, even for them, a little bit surreal. <laughs> Having got over the initial shock, this stone coffin seemed unusually large, over seven feet. And all I could think of, gosh, whoever's in there must be absolutely enormous. And it was just astounding to think of someone so large. It's always been, as we understood, the abbot's garden, so the fact that there is this enormous stone coffin in it um, seems uh, most peculiar. Uh, and uh, it's now a question mark of who on earth could it be? I'd like to know too. But one thing's likely, this person was probably connected with the abbey. The best place to look for clues is in the abbey church, all that remains of the original buildings. 1,300 years ago, the Abbey was founded by Benedictine monks, and its history's packed with colourful characters who might well have been given such a grand burial. There's the first abbot, St Alden, legendary worker of miracles. He looks like quite a tall man. Or could it be my hero, Brother Elmer, the monk who thought he could fly, and famously jumped from the Abbey's 430-foot spire to prove it? Stuntman Colin Skeeping today left off the top of the tower at Malmesbury Abbey to recall the day in the year 1000 when Brother Elmer, a Benedictine monk, decided to take to the air. Amazingly, despite not having a safety wire, Elmer flew 200 yards and managed to survive, but he did break both his legs. Perhaps the most tantalising possibility of all is Athelstan the first Saxon king of all England. His tomb lies in the far corner of the abbey, but it's empty. Popular rumour has it that the bones were removed from the abbey as protection from relic hunters and buried in the abbot's garden. That garden now belongs to the Pollards. Could the coffin that Martin discovered really contain the lost bones of King Athelstan? The problem is that Athelstan died in 939, and the coffin in the garden next door looks at least 300 years later than that. So I'm far from convinced that it contains his bones, but I'm sure there are a lot of people who disagree with me. 
like the press. Feverish speculation puts Athelstan as hot favourite to be the coffin's resident, with a giant monk coming up in second place. The Pollards decide to share their discovery with the locals. By now, everyone's an expert, and all before the bones have been uncovered. Seven foot and a half an inch long. Yes, very tall. We start at the beginning. Yes, when Henry closed the monasteries down around about 18, sorry, 1530, what happened then? Was it King Athelstan, <laughs> or it might have been St Alden? Looking at it from a romantic point of view, we just wish it was King Athelstan, but... Um... But you never know. Gosh, hail what comet and then this. <laughs> I imagine it's one of the monks from the Abbey, surely. Oh, it's the Saxon um, bishop or something. Uh, was it bishop of the Abbey, they thought? Something to do with King Athelstan, Yeah. It? King Athelstan might have been buried around about there, you know, roughly speaking, within 20 or 30 metres of that spot. But what evidence there is for that, we don't know. It must have been very unusual to have somebody so tall in, in that age. We really need uh, some expert archaeologists, really. Well, we've got one. And the first job for archaeologist John Humble is to remove the exposed skull for safekeeping. The whole garden is protected as a scheduled ancient monument, and because part of it's been disturbed, English heritage must now decide what to do. After Martin the gardener found the coffin, the decision has been made to excavate the burial that lies within it. So John, an English heritage archaeologist, is here at the moment working on it, and um, I've come along to give him a hand. The first stage is to actually create an accurate plan of everything that's been exposed here, and I'm just starting to take out the the upper levels of soil, but I think that there's a good six inches to go maybe before we get down to any bones. All the speculations made me really eager to see the skeleton. I'm hoping that we'll find the vital evidence we need to identify him or her. Well, after a couple of days digging our first clue, the bones are emerging as a complete skeleton, exactly as if a whole body had been laid in the grave. In other words, not the jumble of bones you'd get if these were the reburied remains of King Athelstan. So it looks as if we'll definitely have to rule him out. A few shovelfuls later, and sadly, there's another character to eliminate from our inquiries. The skeleton doesn't quite fill the coffin. I never really expected Athelstan, but I was at least hoping for a giant. But now we've got the whole skeleton exposed, his feet don't reach the end of the coffin, so that idea's out the window as well. It's clear we're going to have to look a lot harder to find out who this person really was. I'm quite sure that the skeleton still has a lot more to tell us, but not here. First, it has to be carefully taken apart, bone by bone, and bagged and labelled before starting its journey to the lab. Actually, there is one more thing I can tell you. There are no signs that the legs have ever been broken, at least not until John started to lift them. So I'm afraid another potential candidate has to go. It can't be Elmer the Amazing Flying Monk either. Is that another piece? But I'm still convinced that this is someone important, perhaps one of the senior monks who lived here over 700 years ago, maybe even an abbot. Before the bones can be examined, we need to clean them up. As the mud washes away, even John and I can tell that whoever was buried in the coffin had some serious dental problems. Oh dear, look at the state of this side. Oh dear, oh. that really is in a bad way. Yeah, look at the root of that one, that's all Ooh, yeah. away as well. And that must have been right deep down in the jaw as well. Very painful. One thing that's always struck me is that at a mouthful of absolutely rotten teeth like this, you must have had the most appallingly smelly breath. Yes. Well, the last time I saw this... Well, for a more definitive opinion, I brought our Malmesbury man to the top bone expert at English Heritage, Dr Simon Mays. I mean, I think the first question is, is it a male? Because we always assumed that it had to be a, a monk and therefore it must be male. Were we right? Uh, yes, 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 we were. Uh, we can be fairly sure it's a male from the pelvis. Um, it's really this notch here that we're looking at and um, the fact that that's fairly narrow uh, really does indicate that it is a male. That's quite a relief. 
we had everybody saying that this person was enormously tall, you know, that he was a giant, six foot four. How tall did he turn out to be in the end? Well, we can estimate height in skeletons by measuring the leg bones and plugging those measurements into a fairly well accepted formula. Mm -hmm. And um, when I did this for, for this individual, he turns out to be about five foot ten. Oh, so not, not a giant then? But... Well, he's, he's not exactly a giant by medieval standards, but he's, he's a few inches, I think, above medieval average for men. Right. OK, so still pretty tall. And what about his age? Well, the best way of estimating age in uh, adult skeletal remains uh, is by looking at the wear on the teeth. Mm. They look pretty worn. Well, that's right. Um, and in fact, the crowns of these two have been completely worn away. Mm. And um, that suggests at least that he was about perhaps in his 50s when he died. Oh, so um, that's quite a good age then. Yeah. So far then, we've got a picture of a man who's about five foot ten tall, late middle aged, what sort of health was he in? I mean, can you get any indication of that from the bones? Well, yes. I mean, if, if we look at the teeth again, um, you can see there are dental problems here. Because um, what's happened here, the uh, pulp cavity has actually been exposed because of the extreme wear. And uh, infection has passed into the pulp cavity um, down the root canal here and has set up an abscess actually in the jaw there. So, dreadful toothache. What about any, any other problems? If we look at some of the metatarsals, these bones that make up the instep of the foot, we can see that there's new bone formation actually on there. Uh, I mean, is this sort of growth on the...? Well, that's right. If, if we compare it to a normal bone from the other foot, you can see normally these bones have a sort of smooth surface there. Um, but you've got this new bone formation. And what's um, caused that? Well, it's quite difficult to be certain. There are a number of possibilities here. Uh, one possibility I initially thought about was leprosy because um, as well as destroying the, 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 the bones of the feet and of the hands, it can also cause this type of new bone formation. But when we looked at the skull, the sort of characteristic signs of leprosy were absent. And so really we're left with some sort of localised infection that's just affecting the left foot and the lower leg. But it's very difficult really to say for sure what that might be due to. Yeah. So the poor chap has got dreadful toothache and probably walked with a limp then? Yes, yes. Right. I think we're getting more of a picture of the person really, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> But are there any signs that he lived a privileged life? Simon has studied hundreds of skeletons of medieval people who clearly didn't. They've given us a vivid picture of how tough life was then. Many suffered from acute sinusitis. The killer disease TB was rife, and osteoporosis was just as common then as it is now. Many children died shortly after birth. And those who survived into infancy, ravaged by hunger and disease, often suffered stunted growth. These are some x-rays of some femurs from some of the child skeletons, and a great number of them show these white lines, Harris lines, going the width of the bone that we can see there. So that they're not just cracks then? Oh no, no, th th those are lines which formed in the bone in life, and they form when growth stops for a while and then starts again. So, I mean, in contrast, our medieval monk, he seems to be a few inches taller than average, um, he's not got any signs of tuberculosis or of sinusitis. I mean, the picture I get is of somebody who's privileged, well-fed, you know, perhaps even, even a bit overfed. I mean, is this, is this going too far? I think it is, I'm afraid, from just one individual. Oh. Uh, I, I, I don't think we can really come to those sort of conclusions. Um, and also I x-rayed his leg bones and found that he too had Harris lines. This is a crucial clue. Harris lines on his bones show that his growth stopped five times between the ages of four to nine, perhaps due to illness or starvation during the winters. So if he was a monk, he may not have been from a privileged background like many of his brothers. Maybe, if he was from a poor family, his parents sent him to the abbey at a young age to give them one less mouth to feed. The next step in the search for his identity is to find out when he died. At Oxford's radiocarbon dating laboratory, a tiny sample taken from one of his bones could give us the answer. Every living thing contains radioactive carbon, but at death, the radioactivity steadily starts to fall. 
So by measuring how much it's decreased, you can work out how long ago that living thing died. But the dating process will only work if enough pure carbon can be extracted from the bone collagen. To do this, the ground-up sample will be left to dissolve in acid, but it'll be several weeks until we get the results. Before any decision is made about what should be done with the coffin, we've invited a couple of very different experts along to tell us more about it. What I'd like to know, David, is where does the stone come from? Well, it's one of the finer oolites and uh, somewhere in this region, I think, but probably not Malmesbury itself. I think uh, a little, little distance away. Obviously carefully selected to be one of the better stones, I would have thought. Tony, you're the stonemason. You start off with the block. How do you actually chop it out? Well, firstly, it will be drawn out with a thing called a drag. And so a mason would mark the whole caboodle out using that. Then, using an axe similar to this, would very carefully chip away from that drag line. Right. So none, none of it's sawn then? Nope. Not that, at all. But this, but this is terribly flat, isn't it? it what about is. these marks over here? I mean, they're the same instrument. Well, there were various uh, types of axe. I found this axe near a medieval wall. Um, I actually dug it up and it would appear that it's a similar tool and probably contemporary to this coffin. I mean, it's, it's a vague possibility that uh, this could well have been the tool that did this job. Was that head recess cut out with the same sort of tool? Yeah, um, it's not actually difficult to form those. And what, what's also interesting is that whoever did this was right-handed because as a right-handed person, it's very easy for me to chop this way. But working left-handed, I have to work this way. See how the axe goes into these um, recessions here. So that is completely different to this. What do you feel about the level of craftsmanship that's gone into making this, David? Well, obviously a lot of work's gone into it and uh, I would have thought it was destined to be used by somebody rather important. The medieval man's bones are now spread all round the country. While his right fibula is being carbon dated in Oxford, his skull has travelled across London to University College, where Dr Robin Richards, an expert in facial reconstruction, is going to use it to rebuild the face. The skull is scanned with a laser to produce an accurate three-dimensional image. The missing bits of bone have been built up with wax to give the laser something solid to focus on. Now the contours of the skull have been captured, we've got the foundation on which we can build his face. Robin has designed a programme to work out where all the muscles and soft tissues go. Just wander it around a bit, look at it from different viewpoints. Well, it's fine, it's fine, it's been well reconstructed. All I've got to do now is find a suitable prototype face. We know that he died aged about 50. So to get a prototype face, we need a selection of 50-year-old male faces, which can be blended to make a very average face, free from any unusual features. Now Robin can stretch the face of Mr Average over the computerised skull. What emerges is our first glimpse of the medieval man who was buried in the coffin. Illustrator Jane Braid will take this image and use it as the basis for a coloured portrait. This chap, I think, has got an incredibly strong face. Mm. I mean, first thing to point out, I think, is that the nose is actually genuinely broken. Mm. It is genuinely crooked. That's not something that the, that the computer's right. done. It looks as though his cheeks might be quite hollow. Could, can we have a look at the profile? Yeah. Yes, goodness, look at this. It's really quite pitted. Almost. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So that again is that again is real. Yeah. Um, not a very prominent chin. No. You don't get an idea of the nose being crooked from the profile, no, obviously, you don't. do you? But the picture can only be completed when we know for certain whether or not he was a monk. 
I need to turn the clock back several centuries. What's left of the abbey is just a fraction of what stood here before Henry VIII sacked the monasteries nearly 500 years ago. This is what survives of the abbey today, and our burial seems a long way away from it. But at the height of its wealth and power, the abbey was over twice this size. And if you add back the missing bits, then suddenly the position of the burial becomes clear. It lies right next to the abbey's lady chapel. This is what the abbey would have looked like. This is a further clue to the man's identity. Since he was buried so close to the Lady Chapel, he must have been a powerful member of the abbey, but not an abbot, as then he would have been buried inside. Back in Oxford, atoms of carbon from his bones have been shooting around the accelerator at close to the speed of light to give Dr Christopher Ramsey a date for us. And the date has, has come out to a, a range of between 1150 and 1300. Does that make sense? It fits with what we're expecting, but it's quite a wide range. I mean, can't you narrow it down any more than that? Well, I'm afraid we, we can't in, in, in this case, because it has actually been quite a, quite a complicated case for us, but in a, in a way that you, you might find quite interesting, actually, which is that we've, we've um, done other tests, um, as well as the radiocarbon measurement, and it looks as if the diet of the, of the individual involved was, had a quite a big marine component to it. In other words, he was eating, eating fish. But, I mean, that's strange. I mean, Malmesbury's <laughs> quite a distance from the sea, yes, isn't it? Yes, it, it, it is surprising and, and quite unusual, I think. They were definitely um, smoking fish in that period. We know that um, because there was a fish house, for example, at Glastonbury, where they were smoking fish from the Somerset levels. So it's possible that they've been transporting fish. And it has to be sea fish? It has to be sea fish, not river fish, yes, from this evidence. It was well worth the trip to Oxford. It's a shame the date wasn't a bit more precise, but I'm amazed at what you can tell about somebody's diet from their bones. And that evidence about fish, it really points to him being a monk. Now that the scientific investigation has come to an end, English Heritage want the coffin to be reburied. But Ian and Barbara have other ideas. If there was a way of not disturbing any of the archaeological yeah. information and sort of lifting it, just because there's lifting probably it massive I mean, ide information ide under Ideally, there. it would be nice to actually take it out of the ground. I wouldn't like the coffin to be lifted and exposed um, because that in order to do that, we'd have to do yet more um, archaeological investigation mm -hmm. in a rather kind of keyhole way. We have uncovered it for whatever reason it is there. And I think that the value that it has to all of us is quite considerable, far more than if it is actually covered over again. Because, you know, the Pollards would like to put the coffin on permanent display, but Amanda isn't convinced. The coffin would, I think, suffer, undoubtedly, if it was exposed to the elements. Mm. If we um, get a good stab at finding a way to protect it, mm. and if you'll go along with that, and if we fail, then we'll... Failure, was that? <laughs> <laughs> then we'll protect it the only other way that we can, which presumably yes. would be to, to backfill it. To backfill. Yes, but I think, no, uh, yes, but let's you know, work on it on a positive mm. basis, that we can make it work. I think that we can, at a pinch, accept that, but I don't think it's going to work practically. <laughs> Jane has now added in the details of our monk's clothing and haircut to make him a black-habited Benedictine. To convert this portrait to an animated image, we've come to the Royal National Throat, Nose and Ear Hospital. Gus Lucy is a surgeon who's developed ways of visualising the skull and the face in three dimensions to help in planning surgery. Gus, have you managed to put Jane's painting and Robin's reconstruction together to make a face for us? Yes, indeed, uh, we have. We've um, managed to wrap the artist's impression around the soft tissue reconstruction. He looks great, doesn't he? Oh, there's his broken nose. That's right. All of the features within the face have been reproduced accurately. Uh, using the cheekbones and the uh, forehead and other measurements taken around the face from the skull itself. And so these uh, are true to life as, as to what he looked like in the past. Yeah. 
and it obviously helps once you get the flesh tones back onto it, doesn't it? And then, I suppose for the first time, it really starts to look like a person. Absolutely, absolutely, including the shadows and the other depth cues that you get from using this technique of uh, rendering the images. Yeah, no, it's a remarkable face. That's great, thanks. We've used all the evidence we can find to create a picture of this man and his life. Although he ended it as a respected member of a religious community, perhaps shielded from some of the hardships of everyday medieval life, his bones tell a story of a childhood in which starvation and disease may have played a part. And we can sympathise too with his suffering. After all, toothache in the medieval period was as bad as it is today. But we can never be quite sure of how he died. We can, though, be fairly certain that he died in the Abbey and would probably have spent his last days being cared for in its infirmary. Before his burial in the stone coffin, in a ceremony unchanged for centuries, his fellow Benedictines would have placed his body in a temporary wooden coffin and gathered around it for an all-night vigil. dawn he would have been carried to a favoured plot next to the abbey's lady chapel and buried wearing only the coarse hair shirt that he wore underneath his black habit in life. Ian and Barbara haven't managed to come up with a satisfactory solution to displaying the coffin in the ground, so it has to be filled in. As a compromise, Amanda has agreed that if it's carefully covered, it can be opened up for display in warm weather. The logical way. The bones are still in a box in the ancient monuments laboratory, pending removal to a local museum. I'm sure this is very different from the ceremony that was carried out here over 700 years ago. I think we've all got different feelings about it as well. You might think that the bones of the monk should have been put back where they were originally buried. Or maybe you think that they're better off in a museum where they're safe, and where perhaps in a few years science will tell us more about him. I feel that I've got to know the person over the last few months, and to me, this is the place where I say goodbye. <laughs>